the 10 most wealthiest companies in the world, right? The top 10, the ones that make all the money. They're either a bank or they're a technology company. We're both. Mm, how are so. you a technology company? Uh, welcome to another edition of the Social Proof Podcast. We have uh, we find the dopest people who have actually achieved a level of success. And I really like finding people who not only have achieved success, but can teach how they did it. You know, some people got lucky and they don't know, right, so, how so. they did it, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, we try to find the most amazing people. Um, so we have a gentleman. Uh, we, we haven't known each other too long, but I feel like I want you to be my friend. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just the little conversations yeah. we had, I said, yeah. you need to be a person that I hang out with more yeah. often. Yeah. So um, if you will, man, introduce yourself to the people. Well, I'm A. Donahue Baker. Um, I am a real estate developer, but more importantly, I'm also a co-founder of Money Ave, which is uh, the black fintech bank. And, uh, and I'm here just, you know, building, particularly helping others to help them to build generational wealth. So that's really my, you know, my, my spiel. He said black owned bank. Yes. Black owned bank money Avenue. Yes. Did you see the broker, the broker or the bank, the banker, the banker, yeah, the banker. Yes, absolutely. Definitely influenced uh, a lot of what I do. The banker, that movie is really the, the story of Bernard Garrett and Joe Morris. Mm -hmm. Those two guys remind me personally of, of my other co-founder, Will Mingo. Mm. Uh, it's like his, their story, their plight, the, the obstacles that they went against uh, in a time where it was illegal to really buy blanks, banks and own banks. Yeah. The fact that they were able to purchase multiple banks and we live in this, this society today with all the, the, the level that we've strived to and come to, if they can do it, there's no reason why we can't do it today. There's no excuses. Absolutely. So totally motivational movie. Love it, love it. And uh, it's been an inspirational movie for us. Mm, so you can't, there, there, there gotta be some other black owned banks somewhere. It's 20 of them. It's 20 of them. It's 20 black owned banks. 20 wow. black owned banks, yep. <laughs> and what's gracious. funny, here's the deal, right? So out of the 20 black owned banks, the total assets that each one of those all of them combined is $5.5 billion, right? But if you take the other banks, all the uh, national banks, they control $22 trillion of assets. Mm. So the ratio for black banks are like this compared to what's really available. Wow. So that affects us in so many different ways. It affects the money that comes into our community. It affects the ability for us to earn a living, even to, uh, if you look at banks, most people have the preconceived notion that bankers are greedy, you know, but every single month, $1 billion to $1.5 billion of revenue is created from these, that goes to these banks for simple fees. Like when you bounce a check. Hold on, how much for fee, from fees? Every single month, $1 billion, one to $1.5 billion. That's what each individual, one of the, these major banks, that's what they make every single month, you know, off of wow. fees. Like to have an account, $30. They, get, they, they charge you $15 to $30 just to have an account, right? And then if you bounce a check or if you do something, they hit you with another fee. So they've created this business model that allows them to get a billion dollars a month in revenue. Right. Not Goodness collectively. Gracious. Each one of them is probably making a billion dollars somewhere between one billion and one point five billion and just wow. in fees. So that's where we come in. Right. That's really what we're trying to uh, disrupt that business model. We're trying to we're trying to get that billion dollars a month that they, they make. We're trying to put it in our community, keep it in the uh, pockets of our, our particular members because we don't charge fees. We don't charge those exorbitant fees to have an account. If you, if you overdraft, we have a free overdraft. If you write a check or something like that, we don't charge you a fee for it. We don't really? want you to keep doing it, but we don't charge you a right. fee. You know, <laughs> so, so if you don't uh, charge a fee, how does the bank profit? The business model is this. So our structure is based on we don't charge our customers to bank with us, right? Because those are that's our that's our family, that's our members. We don't charge you any fees. What we do charge is we charge the merchants, right? So if you have, let's say, the typical person, they on their debit card, they they take 30, 40 transactions a month. There's a merchant on the other side of that card, right? We charge the merchant. 
and that's how our business model is uh, sustained. So that's that's basically how it works. We don't charge the, the customer, the member. We charge the merchant, the other side of the transaction, which most people don't mm. realize that every time you use your card, you know, even if it's pennies or or a dollar sometimes, there's a, there's a merchant fee, an interchange fee that is attached to that as well. So, mm. so it's a complex business model, but think about the amount of car transactions just in one day, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. then you start to see how the fees pile up. For sure. For yeah. sure. So let, let's, um, I want to get all into one, how you started a, a, a bank, right? Mm-hmm. Like what it takes to start one. But uh, I want to go back into like you, the person, first off, you got a cool name. Thank That's you. It. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thought it was a cool name. Thank I ain't you. gonna lie to you. Um, but how, so take me back to, um, childhood. How'd you do in school? I was all right. You know, you mentioned the, the name Donahue. I was teased because I didn't realize Donahue was my middle name until I was about 13 years old. Really? Yeah. And uh, long story of how that happened. My mother and my father got divorced. My mother named me Donahue. My father named me Anthony. And uh, it was just this dichotomy that everyone all through school called me Donahue. And I was just... You know, I got teased a little bit about the name, but long, long story short, when I when I got my first job, which was at 13 years old, I needed a Social Security card, and we went down to the Social Security office, and I when it came back, it had Anthony on there. So that was, you know, that was the first time I realized. Like, yeah, who's this? <laughs> yeah. I'm dying. I don't know what y'all talking about. Yeah. So, um, so that's interesting. Right, but, right. Um, but that's you know, uh, when in school, I really. You know, I was a C student right up until about um, my mother passed away. And when she passed away, I, I basically, you know, ran the streets, so to speak, right? Because we grew up in affordable uh, affordable housing complex right. in New Jersey. So, you know, we did, you know, as a, as, a, as a 10-year-old, you know, I got into trouble, you know, same things with our dirt bikes and, yeah. you know, things like that. But, um, you know, as, as, uh, as I got into more trouble, my grandmother... Uh, called my dad and my and my dad came and, and took me in and um and I and, and he added some discipline into my life and mm. immediately you know I turned from like a C student into like an A student really <laughs> so like on, all you're, in you're... one summer like all over the summer so what was it about you being so wh- while you're with your mom was your father in your life during that time no no so during during the divorce I mean my dad was trying to reach out but my mom um would would take us uh, take us and, and, and kind of like run, you know, like we would, we, like he didn't want to. I remember a story one time where my dad came looking for us and he found us and I was so happy to see my dad because I hadn't seen him in so long. But I just thought in the back of my mind, if I bring him home, my mom is going to tear my butt up. So I was just like, you know what? I went down to town my sneakers and I just ran and, and I ran home and I left my dad. You know, and uh, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! Yeah, I, I mean, how did you just run into your father? He was looking for us. He was looking like my my mom left, and uh, and uh, you know, I was I was out playing like kids do. Like I was eight years old, and um, my dad just ran up on me. And I where I mean, were you? I was around my block. I was just on my block. You know, yeah. with you know, with the other local kids. Uh, NKG. That's that's the name of you know what we used to call our little little part of town, but um, just running around playing football in the street, that type thing. And, um, you know, he just ran up on me and, and, uh, and, I, and I ran away from him. And that gave me uh, wow. a complex for so long because a couple years later, my mom's passed away. You know, so it was like, wow, like I, I ran, and I'm sure that hurt my dad. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I ran away from my dad and then uh, uh, it was just, you know, it was a traumatic thing. But when I went home that day, my mother was just so happy. She like, you know, took me out for ice cream. It was, you know, but um, it was. Oh, it she was, didn't know that you ran to your dad. No, no, no. She knew. But oh, I told she, her gotcha. I saw him, and I ran away, and she was happy that I did that. Oh, you know, and um, you know, it was just like it, it, it you know, did something mm, on the inside. So for sure. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, um, you know, I didn't have the best childhood, but yeah. you know, we all we all have things that we have to overcome. Sure, you know, but thank that, God you connected back yeah. with your dad because I guess you were, you you were kind of getting in trouble, and then your mom called your dad to come get you. Yeah, well, when my mom passed away, my mom passed away when I was ten years old, right? Okay. So when my mom passed away, um, my grandmother 
was was uh, was living there, right? So, um, when, so I was raised by my grandmother, yeah. but she was elderly. She was like a little uh, a little lady, a strong little lady, but she couldn't really discipline me. So, yeah. you know, it was like right. you know when you you know in our families and stuff, we used to get beaten, mm -hmm. but my grandmother would beat me. It wouldn't hurt at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I was like, <laughs> I would just feel sorry. Like she would break out the belt. I'd be like, Granny, please. Don't 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 do it. I won't do it again. I'm right, sorry. Right, I'm right. sorry. But uh but yeah, that that was um, you know, God bless her, you know, but but uh she's no longer here. But mm. the bottom line is, um, you know, we we definitely have those strong uh matriarchs in our family. Mm. But when she when she was gone, it, you know, my dad, he came in and, and really kind of picked the mantle up and that mm. changed my life around totally. You mm. know, my sister at the time um, she's in she's in Atlanta now too, right? Mm -hmm. I gotta go see her. So, but uh, my sister, you know, she had she she got pregnant at sixteen. She's older, you know. So we would just, you know, a lot of lot of the pitfalls of being a teenager, I experienced it, yeah. you know, and uh, and and it was really the result of not having a good parental structure, you know, and just allowing kids to just do whatever they want to do, mm -hmm. you know. But when I went with my dad, it was like I had discipline, you know, and that mm -hmm. really changes the paradigm for me. Yeah, you know, all black my life. boys need a black male <laughs> figure in Truth. their life. You know what I'm saying? Because if you don't know what structure looks like, how can you, you, you can't identify with it. So we Absolutely. act out. And uh, mm -hmm. I was blessed to have my father in my life too, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still even, he's, he, he's, he's gone as well, but um, I still hear his voice in mm -hmm. my head. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. my, my dad never really had to yell. Yeah. yeah. Right? So it was almost like, you, there was not much yelling in my household. Mm. My dad would tell me to do something. And you just do if it. I didn't do it, there's consequences. It's not wow. like, do it. Yeah. Didn't I tell you? <laughs> okay, look, I, I tell you one more time. My dad was like, yo, do yeah. it. Yeah. If I don't, come on, you know what this is. You feel me? Yeah, nah, Man, that's important, awesome. important to have, you know? And yeah. I struggle with that now because um, I grew up under uh, corporate pun punishment, right? Mm. Um, I have a three-year-old son right now. His name is right. Legacy. Nice. I've I've really never hit him, you know. I did a little don't do that, but mm -hmm. I've never had to like spank him, get a belt or anything like that. But you know, there may come a day. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, legacy. He's not saying he won't. He said he has. A, there may he come has a day, you know. Right, right. So, but um, but yeah. So that's that's such a um a strong stronghold in my life is to be an example for legacy, but also give him the discipline that I know I needed yeah. growing up. So, wow. um, yeah, man, fathers, man, fathers can shape or break a situation. You 100%. Know? Yeah. So moving, did you go to college? Yes, yes, I did go to college. I went to school in D.C., um, Georgetown. I went, went to school oh, nice. out there. What Love. year? What year I graduated? Yeah. I graduated in 97 in, from Georgetown. Yeah. Ah. So I, um, I was down when there. When did Iverson you know, go there? Iverson yeah. was, was there. Iverson was there. He was there while you was there. But Iverson left early, right? So Iverson gotcha. left early. Um, but y'all were there at the same time? Uh, he, all right, so this is what happened. So I started, I took a year off to do music. Well, I mm -hmm. took some time off to do music. I came in when uh, Alonzo Mourning was there, mm -hmm. the Kembe Matumbo. Oh, uh, word. Yeah, those guys were superstars on campus, right? Mm. So I was there. Then, uh, then um, AI came in uh, a couple like after that, after they left, gotcha. right? So then that's when I went back uh, the year, I think AI had decided to make the decision of, to mm. leave and then, then I came Did back. Did you ever connect with him, like hang out with um, him? Or? Nah, nah, AI, cause, okay. cause um, when, I was, when I came back, AI wasn't there. Gotcha, oh, know? gotcha, So when gotcha, I came gotcha. back, he wasn't there. But, um, but I did definitely connect it with the Kembe Mutombo, uh, Alonzo Morning. Uh, I was in class with the Kembe one time. So Where? I tell you, gotta tell you about the Kembe story, right? Tell me. Yo, <laughs> so in class, it's about, uh, 60 people in the class, and it's like rows and rows back. So the Kembe is totally incapable of uh, whispering, right? <laughs> totally, he totally, he just, this vocal cords, it just doesn't work, right? right? So we in class, we sitting in the back, the Kembe is like, used to call me a FBI, right? FBI because um, I used to be in this rap group, we were under Teddy Riley, mm -hmm. and uh, it was, uh, the name of the group was called FBI, mm -hmm. but he used to um, say FBI. So he said, uh, FBI, what is the answer to number four? And we in the back, the whole <laughs> class turns around like this. <laughs> yeah. 
so all that's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that was that was hilarious, yo. Wow, but, are you still uh, connected with those guys? Yeah, I mean, uh, I haven't spoke to him in a minute, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, good dude. I know he's doing great things in, in Africa yeah. and Dikembe. I mean, he's just he's an incredible person, yeah. man. Just a real, you know, good-hearted, you know, person. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Zoe's doing his thing uh, down there in in Miami. Him and his uh, wife Tracy, they mm-hmm. got the foundation that's going on. So awesome. you know, everybody's doing their thing, man. Real, yeah. Really, really proud and g- glad that you know being so attached to them. Just by being a Hoya, absolutely. For sure, for sure. Yeah. And what did you take up in college? Uh, accounting and marketing. But at this time, you were signed to Ter- Teddy Riley, right? Yeah, so we had uh, we had the, the hip-hop group, right? Mm-hmm. So what I was doing is I was producing at the time. So by the time I went to college, um, I started co- out of high school, I started college. Then I took some time off to pursue music, mm-hmm. right? So then during that whole era, um, you know, we would travel i'll be going back and forth to the studio in fact when i came back um i don't know if you know the artist a marie yeah all right so a marie i was part of discovering a marie right oh really at georgetown yeah oh, so wow. um so oh, she from, went there she went to georgetown Got correct you. so when a marie was there you know we worked with a marie we used to i used to basically drive her bring her to the studio out in jersey bring her back to school you know just we we would work and we put a lot of time into her career mm-hmm. and uh you know, she's where she is, you know, uh, you know, had some success in the game and, you know, so it's an incredible thing. Yeah, that's one thing I, I tell. I don't necessarily think you need college to be successful, mm-hmm. but the relationships that you build in Absolutely. college, is, you, you can't get those anywhere else, man. And it's some, like some of my best friends to this day are people that, you know, I met during college, you know, and uh, right now they're the titans of their industry. Mm-hmm. Like whatever I need, whatever information, whatever network, you know, I can call up somebody, whether it's politics, whether it's, I mean, if I wanted to touch Obama, you know, those connects allow me to do that. And wow. that's what I'm working on right now, by the way. Nice. We do got to nice. connect to <laughs> I love do it. something with Obama. So, yeah. but uh, but that that's basically, you know, college has its merit and, yeah. and uh, it's not so much about the degree. The degree is whatever, right? Yeah. You can, it's so much that you can learn without having a degree. But I just think that the experience, you know, yeah. at that point in your life when, you know, I was what, 18, going to school, didn't really have, uh, I had to reinvent myself because I was on this campus, but everybody was going through the exact same thing. Yeah. So clicking yeah. up and just and just having those relationships, like the people that I went to school with, I can honestly say, like, we don't talk maybe every day, but when we get together, it's like we never, you know, we still got stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my aunt was crazy too. My roommates in college, they're all lawyers right now. Mm. So we get on a Zoom call sometimes, you know, everybody's in different parts of the country mm. doing their thing, but they're all attorneys. I'm the only one that is not an attorney. But wow. uh, just hearing their, their journey, hearing what's going on with their families and stuff like that, yeah. it just, you know, it, it, it's the, the relationships, man. Those I wouldn't trade a million dollars for those relationships. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I'm super interested in this concept of being the bank because I play Monopoly a lot. It's my mm. favorite game. Yeah, I love Monopoly too. And, and I always want to be the bank. I, yeah. For some reason, yeah. I feel more comfortable controlling the money. <laughs> but I'm, 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 I want to yeah. get into like, uh, like what shapes someone to have the audacity to say, "Yo, I'm going to be the lender. I'm going mm. to be the bank." Right? Because mm. I, I mean, that that's not like starting a a small real estate company mm. or fixing and flipping real estate. That's not mm. like starting. A, I don't know, a, a social media management firm. Cool stuff, but mm-hmm. this is like high level, like red tape that you got to fight through, mm-hmm. and become somebody that um, that like that clears the path for a whole group of people. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. For for a whole race of people, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I'm 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 going through the story and what's shaping you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So. I know you uh, You got heavy into real estate. Was that after college? Simultaneously. So, yeah, I graduated first, and then I purchased my first piece of real estate. Gotcha. But um, the psychology is just this. While I uh, left school, I started to work for a accounting firm. And then at that point, I pivoted. I, I, for a short time, I worked for a family office. I don't know if you know what a family office is. Mm-hmm. All right, a family office is... Hold on, you went to school for accounting, graduated, mm-hmm. and got a job in accounting. Yes. Right. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. Then yeah. you got 
You got your then, first. What was your first job out of college? My, my first job was with in a, a company called USF and G. They're probably not even around anymore. Uh -huh. But then I went to did a little stint at a family office, gotcha. and then I was like, you know, what, I'm gonna start my own thing based on what I learned at the family what office. What was the family office? Tell me All about right, it. So the family office is um basically it's an organization that uh, basically is about 20 people right that mm -hmm. are in the family office. They really are only concerned about people and families that have a net worth of about 100 million and more, right? Mm -hmm. You have 10 million net worth, they really don't care about you, they really? move right along. But the family office, these 20 people, work exclusively on a different vertical in wealth. So you might have a person that does just insurance. So for the 100 million, they figure out the best insurance product for you, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a big athlete, they make sure that, you know, they insure your knees, make sure that your elbows are insured, you know, maybe go to Lloyd's of London, get a special policy for you, but they find the best insurance and to cover your downside. They may have a person that does uh, taxes, right? Mm -hmm. This is, which is what I did, right? So, so basically, I figure out the best tax structure for you and basically how could you put, how could we put you in vehicles where you pay zero taxes mm -hmm. we all know about amazon paying zero taxes but they made over a billion dollars mm -hmm. it's things that they they do we talk, we know about donald trump right donald trump um basically paid zero taxes for a long period of time the psychology is why but the family office is they, they, they put you in a position where you're maximizing your wealth and your wealth makes money for you Right, mm. so that's the idea. They but before also, you go, you have to have a high net worth. Like you gotta they have, only that's all, that's their client base, right? Yeah. So so most people that don't really know about wealth would have no idea what a family office does yeah. or what they're about. But if you're Dang, that's crazy because I had no idea what a family. office yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right, well, shots yeah, fired. It's a, a, it's a wealth. It's a it's a wealth thing, right? So yeah. it's like they're not on the typical radar until you do certain things, like get into real estate. You no, know, at the family office, you realize that. The wealth creation is really done through real estate, right? So when you're doing big real estate development projects, a lot of the money that's in the family office, they don't want to just have it sitting in a bank. So it has to be deployed, has to be put to use. And family offices are a prime source along with insurance companies and banks as well. But family office is also a, a, a destination, a spot where you can get money to invest in, in development deals. Mm. If they're safe, they only tolerate a certain level of risk. Right? Mm. So it's really about, you know, what's the cap rate? How sure is this this money? They don't like risk, right? They definitely don't like risk, but that's the that's really the key. But other okay. other thing too, I don't want to uh, neglect, and I want people to understand when you understand the family office. There's another dynamic, something that I really didn't know. Family offices, they all have lobbyists, and you may think, why do why does a family office have a lobbyist? Well. Number one, the lobbyists go to Washington, and this is this is what you have to understand about wealth. They control our laws, so they go to Washington and they make sure that the bills that are coming up that could possibly affect wealth have loopholes in them, so that the wealthy are preserved, that the wealth that they represent are preserved. So when you go down to Washington, you know, you know that's one of the things we went to Georgetown. I'm always on K Street and figuring out those law firms. They put, they write the, the, the legalese, the language that consists of, of, of the actual law. And mm. the legalese is written in such a way that there's loopholes that are created and it allows wealth to basically be preserved or, uh, you know, not be taxed that a typical person would, would normally be taxed. It's a very important fact. And, and it, was, it was something that was, you know, eye opening to me as well. Wow. You know what I'm thinking? There's a law, and then there's just some really smart people who figure out a way around it. But you're saying they write in the loopholes so that, okay, here's the law, but we wrote in how we're going to get around the law that we created. Absolutely. Absolutely. So take, um, first of all, the law gets written every year, right? Why you, you think the law of the land, you just write it. But no, they write the IRS code every single year, and it has to go through Congress. Right. So what happens is, you know, trends start to emerge. So what happened with the last Trump tax law is um, it became in vogue to have an S corp. So 20 percent of your liability now becomes tax free. A lot of people that had LLCs didn't you know what they weren't positioned for that. 
So there's a shift that happened, and a lot of times you need to understand where wealth is going. If you understand where it's going before it goes there, you can meet people there, and you can position yourself to take advantage of that. So if you're one of the people that you know, had employees and shifted to an S-corp, you got this 20% windfall that came through you last year if you did your taxes, right? Mm. But every year there's a new trend. There's a new uh, thing that you should spot and position yourself with. You have to watch where wealth is going and what they're trying to protect, right? Something that came out of that was um, the opportunity zones that we that we talk so heavily about. So the opportunity zones was, it's a it was a manufactured piece of legislation that really started from the hedge fund owners that had hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that were tied up into the valuations of privately owned companies. And in order to tap that money, they would be hit with the significant capital gains tax. They basically came up with a plan. Um, the senator from my state, Cory Booker, and also uh, another black, uh, uh, black senator, Tim Scott, who's a Republican, they both worked together to craft this bill uh, the Opportunity Zones, ushered it through Congress, got it signed. That was, a lot of that was lobbyist work. A lot of that was, you know, working across the aisles and the political stuff, granted. But that was a plan. That was the wealthy people coming up with the plan to make money. That's, that's really what it is. And I'm not bashing Opportunity Zones because if you're into real estate and you're in a town that uh, has an Opportunity Zone, you have an opportunity to take advantage of it. But you would never know if you don't follow the wealth, if you don't follow the movement and understand the psychology of wealth. It's out there. The opportunities are out there. But you need to be tapped in so you say, well, that's coming down the pike. If you knew the opportunity zones were coming, the first thing you want to do is take your municipality, position your municipality so you get as many opportunity zones in your city. But if you mm. don't know that it exists, what happens is the governor of your state makes up the opportunity zones according to how he wants the opportunity zones to be, right? And that basically deprives a lot of people of wealth, right? So if you live in the hood and there's no opportunity zone in your hood, you know, that, that's not... You know, that's not the people that's, that's writing the bills. You didn't know mm. enough to reach out to your local municipality to get involved and, and make sure that you have opportunity zones in your hood so you can get all of those millions, hundreds of millions of dollars infused into your particular town. So can you explain what an opportunity zone does and how you take advantage of it? Because I, I literally just bought a building mm -hmm. and it's in an opportunity zone. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, you hear, oh, it's an opportunity zone, oh, you can save money on taxes or whatever, but... Mm -hmm. I honestly don't know what it means. I just know it's a good thing, right? <laughs> but look, uh, for the for the for the standpoint from you, just to understand the opportunity zone, it is just a designation, right? And it's a designation that is is um, the governor appoints a certain areas an opportunity zone, which is designated for investment. Now, the people that have the money, the hundreds of millions of dollars, the wealth, where that money um, is there, they're incentivized to invest in a particular opportunity zone area, right? Mm. That, so so that, the governor says this plot, this this city, this small town or wherever it is, mm -hmm. I want people to invest in building up this particular area. So I'm going to incentivize people to put their money in this area for whatever agenda they have, mm -hmm. right? I need this area built up. Absolutely, right? They the, so the the governor makes basically appoints the wet area. What it, what a it, it may be a whole town. Well, it's never a whole town. It's usually a section of a town. However, um, the, the people that are really, really sharp and that were up on this legislation, there are whole towns that are opportunity zones, right? But to answer your question, um, when people, when that, when that money that's sitting on the sidelines, when they spot an investment opportunity in an opportunity zone, it allows them to invest for a period of up to 10 years, and they are not taxed on it. The tax is, is basically wiped out. So you can have large amounts of money moving in here tax-free, which is a significant windfall if you are, um, you know, if you have to take it and get hit with the capital gains tax. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, you mm. know. The best analogy that I can give you um, with that and how the impact of and how much money we're talking about is um, the New York Yankees. You, are you familiar with uh, George Steinbrenner? Uh, he owns the Yankees, yes? Yeah, so his son does. So, But I'm talking about his dad, right? George Steinbrenner. I think Jay-Z might have said it in a yeah. red one song. That's all I really know. So, so George Steinbrenner died on December 31st, right? right? If George Steinbrenner had died on 
January 1st of the year in which the inheritance tax had taken one day later, he would have lost about 500 to 300 million dollars on the inheritance tax, right? It was a billionaire and that's how much his estate would have had to pay had this man died 24 hours later. What? So we're talking about significant amount of money here with that legislation. So they ain't often did they? It was, no, it was, it was, it was it a just, circumstance. It was, it was circumstance. Definitely was circumstance. Uh, so. Could have been some foul play in there. You know what I'm <laughs> no, yo, know, that that yeah. is amazing. How, like, how did you start to learn all this stuff? Um, follow. I'm, I'm. I consider myself to be a student of wealth. Right, looking at how wealth is created and what are the best ways to create wealth, and that's really had been my journey since I had a, a CPA practice. It was really taking everyday people and creating millionaires. So a lot of what I did is, is basically I came up with this moniker, thousandaires to millionaires. And, and, and basically how I do that is a combination of tax strategy, right? And, and you have to realize if you want to build generational wealth, there's really only two ways to do it. You have to own real estate, I'm talking about income producing real estate, not just owning your house. Hold on, let me take these notes, man, real quick. Are y'all taking notes back there? Goodness gracious, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so, so you, two ways. Two ways, right? So you gotta own income producing real estate, right? Not just owning your house you live in, not just owning a, a $10 million house. That $10 million house is a liability. You have to um, own real estate that pays you, that mm -hmm. could, you basically could, could will to someone else, someone that literally you're making money in this, in your sleep. I'm okay. not talking about wholesaling, flipping, anything like that. I'm talking about buy and hold income producing real estate, right? Yep. So that's the first way. The second way is understanding the dynamics of business. You have to create some type of business that can run itself. Some type of business that has systems in place that allows you to replicate those systems over and over. Right. And we live in a particular society right now today where we're living in a time where um, if you don't know, you better know about technology because technology is allowing us to rapidly produce and scale very, very quickly. Right. Mm. Um, so I predict within the next 10 years, you're going to have a teenage billionaire. There's going to be some teenager out there that's going to create an app, create some software, create something that's going to be a billionaire because that's where it's going. If you're not plugged into that, if you don't have, you don't know how to take your business, whatever it is, and apply that layer of technology to it and scale it, you're going to be behind. And then you're also going to be competing against well-funded organizations. So the time is now, and I'm telling people that if you really want to create generational wealth, you got to go down one of those two roads, the real estate road or the business road. Mm, so real estate and business. What about like investing, uh, stocks? I mean, I mean, I'll tell you like or this. Or just building a building a traditional, well, I guess that's understanding business, right? Or building a business? Yes, building a traditional business, yes. So investing in stocks, um, the way to invest in stocks, if you want to create generational wealth, is you want to do that pre-IPO, right? You want to take your money, and this is what we do at the bank. We want to invest in entrepreneurs and real estate developers. We want to create more of those. So we have money that we set aside to invest in entrepreneurs. And of course, you know, we'll get a percentage of your equity of your business, but that's the investment side of it, right? That's the way that I believe if you want to create wealth, that's how you should be investing in the stock market. The average person is at a disadvantage investing in the stock market. No disrespect to the Wall Street Trapper and, and, and all of those. I think it's great. Shout out to Trapper. That's my brother right there. Well, now, now, yeah, shout out, shout out to him. And I love what he does, right? And I think it's great, the message that he's putting forth. But uh, if you're looking to build generational wealth, right. trust me when I tell you, you can be successful making money short term on the stock market, but you're at a disadvantage. You're at a disadvantage against high-speed traders. You're at a disadvantage against inside trading. You're at advantage against the system. Right. So when people come and they say, well, you know, learn how to do this Forex, you have to understand there's hundreds and thousands of people that they're teaching you how to get on this platform of Forex. But the people that are really making money, the people that own the platform. So they're training you to do what they want you to do. And that's where the money is being made. So whatever it is, you have to follow the wealth. And, you know, there's people that make money in stocks. There's people that make money in, um, you know, in, in, in really 
a whole bunch of different things. But if right. you're really, to me, you need to be in pre-IPO level. Find a business model that works, that can take right. root, invest in it early, and you're and you're, you're gonna be you're gonna make tremendous amount. The janitor that worked at Microsoft yeah. is a multimillionaire. Why? Yeah. Because everyone that worked there got a piece of equity. And then when that when that IPO came, whoop, you know. Wow. So you know, I had um, I think I put about what it was five there. So in 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 my first account that I started setting up, in my my Robinhood account. I, I invested about $5,000 myself, and it turned into eleven, which is good, right? I mean, that's that's your money working for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so what you're saying is you take maybe like your gains or, you know, you, you still have your, your money f- working in the stock market, things of that nature, but mm-hmm. you're saying let that be one strategy of like making money, but in terms of generational wealth, like right. if you want to get wealthy. It's right. In terms of generational wealth, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know a lot of people, right? You know, working mm-hmm. like as a CPA, I don't know a lot of people that can literally say they invested in a stock, and they don't. They they don't have to work, and their family doesn't have to work. Anymore. I see what you're saying. You know? I see what you're but saying. But I do know a lot of people that invested in a company before they hit the IPO, or even the company got so big they didn't even need to do an IPO, right? Mm. And they got so big, um, you know. They, wealth was created, serious wealth was created. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not, you know, saying don't invest in stocks. Right. You know, it's good to diversify. You right. know, me personally, I, I invested in stocks. I invested in Tesla. I was one of the first 40 people in the state of New Jersey to own a Tesla. Really? Right? Correct. And I still have, I have multi, I had multiple Teslas along the way. But the fact of the matter is I made a lot of money off Tesla, but I've realized I bought Tesla at $33, right? $33, right? Yeah. The fact of the matter is when it when Tesla hit about uh 300, I got scared. Wow. And I, I was like, what if this what if I lose? What if it cuz it's a volatile stock. You can't lose. It. 30 you bought it at 30 right. well, you, lose can't, you, you can't have. lose, yeah. right? So yeah. so there's an approach and there's many different strategies to take money off the table. Me mm-hmm. personally, I said, look, I'm going to take that money out and put it all in real estate. Mm. All in real estate. And that's when my development career really took off. That's when I was able to buy income producing um, multifamily housing. Like we bought a a 100 unit apartment complex, a 200 unit apartment complex. Um, We're working right now on a 400 unit apartment complex. That's what gave me the money to really do bigger and better things. I had to leave the stock market, you know, Mm. because... Um, it's, it's, it, it, you know, until you hit, until you get lucky and hit on a company like that, you know, you, most people don't make money. That's gotcha. basically what it is. All right. So straight out of, you are just a wealth of knowledge. I knew we was going to be cool. Like, <laughs> you seem like somebody like you, you got to have a you in your corner somewhere. <laughs> no, yeah. So, um, so straight out of, uh, well, during college, right. Mm-hmm. You invest in your first piece of real estate. Yep. Was it single family? Was it? It was a duplex right here in Atlanta, Shambly Dunwoody. Right? Word. Lived in one side, rented out the other, and uh, I mean that was the rent free lifestyle. Right? Yeah. <laughs> totally the rent free lifestyle. So I think I had to pay like two hundred like after the rent was paid. I had to pay like two hundred dollars. But I had this. I mean, my house was like I had a backyard, and I mean wow. it was really nice, you know. So, but right here in Shambly Dunwoody. Wow. Right? How much did you buy it for? Do you remember? Um, I think I bought it for like uh, seventy, eighty thousand dollars back then. Yeah, it really? was. Yeah, what it year was, a, was this? You think this was in ninety three. Ninety three. Gotcha. Yeah. You still have it? I sold it. That's the go. only property I've ever sold. Really? Oh man, I wanted to kick my, kick myself. How but, much you sell it for? Um, it was. It went at a. It, I think I sold it for almost double what I paid for it. So I think you made I sold seventy thousand. Yeah, but it it was just a bad. It was like that property would have. You know, I'd have been It'd making be crazy right yeah, now. But uh, but I sold it because I left Atlanta and you know moved back up north. So that was the thing. And that is the only, and how many properties do you have now? I have over five hundred units right now. But I've wow. never sold a property after that because right after I sold it, um, they developed that whole area, man. You were and there was I was I came back and saw it. I'm like my house isn't even there anymore. So I was just like, man. I messed up. <laughs> wow. All right, so, and what was your next property? My next property was, so I went back up to uh, Jersey. And I feel like I'm skipping around. Did you, at, when you left the, the family practice, mm-hmm. you started your own. 
Yes, I started doing my own CPA practice, helping people to build wealth through mm. taxes. Why? Right? Why'd you leave? Um, was it too much? You saw too much? Not Yeah, I, I felt like, you know, I, here's, here's the deal. And this is my rationale, right? And, I, and this, this was deep to me at the time, but the way that any business model works, when you get a paycheck, whatever that paycheck is, you're worth about four times as much as that paycheck. Because if, if, if you are worth equal to that, or if you were worth exactly equal to that paycheck, the company would be losing money. So if you think about it, if you got a job and you're making $200,000 a year in salary, you're worth about $800,000. Mm. So if you're worth $800,000, you got to tap in to how can I get that valuation? How can I get that $800,000, my utmost potential? How can I live to my utmost potential? The way to do it is I had to become an entrepreneur after I learned how to build wealth and how do I use all of this knowledge that I've accumulated working with various clients to basically help other people build wealth. And that's the, the, the premise from which I said, you know what, I'm gonna go out and do it. And that's exactly what I did. Wow, yo, that is a formula right there. Mm -hmm. If a company pays you what you're worth, they'll lose money. That, that's, that's the business, that's the, the American way, you know? That's what the definition of an employee is. If you want, if you're an employee, that's really what it is. So you think people like, um, take your favorite NBA athlete, right? Your favorite NBA athlete gets a check. Right? LeBron James. LeBron James, right? And and not hating on LeBron, but Le, and LeBron is a very wealthy man, right? Way wealthier, more wealthy than me, right? Mm. But the fact of the matter is he's still an employee. The person that wrote him the check, LeBron is worth at least four times that to him, to that person. Mm, right? So good. Okay. Think about Patrick Mahomes, the hundred million dollar contract, right? The owner of the NFL franchise, you know. Patrick Mahomes worth about half a million dollars. Pay me more. That's a discount, right? So, mm, that shouts out to the, the Joe Button. I don't know him personally, but he's, <laughs> he's like the the goat in this space. Yeah. And I, I think that's what he was saying when he was leaving shop, uh, Spotify. Is yo, I know what I'm worth. Yeah, you you have to know what you're worth in order to to go there. Right. And, and the friction it. is, if I'm the company, I can't pay you what you're worth. Then I. It just don't work. Just not, the business model doesn't work. Mm. So it's, it's very so. So let's say that I'm offering a position at a job, right? And I have a budget, right. and I know what this this budget is. I have a budget for the job, but it only makes sense if that person that I'm hiring is bringing in four times what they're bringing in. That's the multiple. Yeah, I like it. So yeah. you go do your own practice, right? Yep. How'd it go? Well, well, you know, I've, I've, um, I've had lots of clients along the way. I've learned how to deal with people. I've built up a following. I have people that, you know, to this day with, with friends, you know, because, um, you know, I'm invited to weddings. I get, yeah. you know, you're a member of the family. For sure. You know, you when you, their money, you yeah, take care of people money, you making them money, you getting them to think about things they've never thought about before. You showing them how to build wealth. You show them the process. Right. And everybody I did it through real estate. I became a multimillionaire off real estate. Right. But there's so many other ways to do it. Other businesses. But I think my true value is connecting the dots, putting people with other people. And that's really, I think, you know, has has allowed a lot of other businesses to scale. You know, how do you monetize it? Because I think I'm good with that, too. Yeah. So I think that's like one of my gifts. Yeah. So how you monetize it is number one, see, seeing the vision. Right. Mm -hmm. See the vision. And then insert yourself, right? <laughs> you know, um, but it. you know, you insert yourself, basically say, look, somebody comes to me, people come to me with real estate deals all the time, mm -hmm. right? We can't fund every single real estate deal that comes through the table, but we have partners and our partners, we connect. Somebody needs money. We connect them with, with our partners and we, you know, we get inserted in the deal some way. So that's, that's a form of monetization. Oh, I like that. Okay, I like that. And, you know, shout out to my man, Nehemiah Davis. He he really just put me on that. He's like, yo, everybody you do these interviews with, there needs to be an affiliate link. True. And he, he so if you're listening, just go, if you're going to buy Nehemiah's book, just buy it through my affiliate link in the YouTube video. <laughs> but, um, like, I, I, I think he gave it to me, like, the, like, a link for his particular course. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't selling the course. It's just mm -hmm. people trust him based off the interview. Mm -hmm. And uh, my affiliate link over, like, two, the first two days, I made $1,000. I yeah. said, oh, I get it now. Yeah. I've interviewed 60-something people. And if every two days, uh, I... 
Yo, I, I, I just want to say thank you. Yeah, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but real talk, let me talk about Nehemiah real quick, man. I love you know what Nia? he's doing. I don't know him, man. I don't know him, you know, but you I love what he, I saw your interview with him, man. Mm. That joint was, that was a good interview, man. Like, yeah. I, I love what you're doing too, brother. You, brother. But <laughs> just the, you know what it is? It's the gems, it's the nuggets, it's what we need in our community. We need to create more creators, being a creator. You know, and that's really the key. I say it all the time. Poverty does not have to exist. And to me, there's no poverty problem. What is the problem is a lack of creativity, mm. right? If you're creative, you will never be in poverty. And he embodies that, you know. Mm. So I know I'm going to meet the brother someday. I'm going to oh, tell yeah, it to him's sure. face, you know what I'm saying? But I don't know him. But um, but the creativity with that brother is you know, yeah. and the passion, like I could tell is, you know, he, he's passionate, you know, yeah. he's a line. Like, you know how some people be like, yo, his soul is, is like a lot. I feel like that with him yeah. when I, when I, when I see him and, and, and hear him talk. You know, I so. feel like we all need to go to dinner tonight. Yeah. I would call Neil and say, yo, we need to go to dinner tonight. Um, yeah. Cause that would be awesome. But yeah. if y'all do do some business and search your boy in the yeah. deal, yeah. We got, we got I'm, I'm taking notes right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you got, you got to uh, your, your first property. Uh -huh. Okay. You sold it. Mm -hmm. And you take that money in. You're st you still have your yeah, firm. Yeah. So at this when point, I sold, right? now here's here's what I, the the thing. When I sold that property, that money did not go into real estate. I totally spent that money on really living, which is why I kicked myself. Did you have your firm at this point? No. But when I sold my property, yeah. I actually was still. I, I went back up top, and I was basically just leaving Atlanta. Gotcha. So I was still kind of like working, but I took that money and I, I did I did not buy more real estate with that one property. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I kicked myself because. Gotcha. The money you make in real estate, all you need to do is throw it back in real estate. It just it it's a cash cow, yeah. right? It's literally if you the strategies that, that we tell you to do, the buy and hold, um, that we want to encourage, it's literally focusing on doing one deal a year. If you can do one deal a year, you always make more money this year than you did last. And if you live throughout that, it's giving yourself a raise every single year. And that's basically what I've done. You know, just try to do one deal a year. Do that one deal and, you know, push yourself to try to make it a, a deal that is going to be impactful to your bottom line. Yeah. So everything from the perspective of cash flow, right? And cash flow that I'm at the point right now where I have enough units where I can hire a property manager and they handle everything else. All I'm doing is going out here, analyzing deals and and, and, and finding my next opportunity. And, and once I close it, I'm making more money than I did last year. You know, wow. So, you, so your advice to the beginning entrepreneur: get one, and then one deal a year. So, so like I bought the twoplex, right? right. The next step for me, um, even though I sold it, was to buy a fourplex. Right. So I bought the do. I, I bought the, then I then I bought a sixplex, right? Bought a six unit apartment complex. Then I didn't. I tried to double, so I basically set myself up. It wasn't a 12 unit, but I did yeah. buy a 10 unit, right? Mm -hmm. Then I went from a 10 to a 24 unit. So you try to double, you know, I tried to double each particular year, step my game up and get into bigger apartment complexes. And that was basically um, how I entered into that apartment game. And wow. now that's my specialty. I only buy apartment complexes. I don't get involved in office space. I don't get involved in industrial. Um, I just focus on apartment complexes. I know them like the back of my hand. I'm an yeah. expert at finding, funding, and acquiring apartment complexes. The last uh, deal that we just bought, 100 unit apartment complex, we paid uh, $5.6 million for the apartment complex. The valuation of this property is now over $12 million. That's how well. What it last paid. year? What would you buy? Bought it, bought it in September. We closed on it uh, September 30th. Of yeah. last year? Of last year. So you bought it for five? $5.6 million. $5.6. That's it worth 5 .6. what? It's worth over $12 million now. So that is what forced the power, forced appreciation, finding these assets. Um, and this is what we teach. I, I, I kind of have a, a core of mentor mentees that I mm -hmm. that I have 20 students um, we have a, a group called the apartment acquisition academy that it, it's really closed to, to the public because I put so much time into it but um, just 20 students that we just work with and and, and do that same thing like our students are going to go on to do some great things a couple of them are working on uh, you know multiple hundred unit developments right now wow yeah. how much do you need to get into that game um it depends right so it's really about the first thing you need to do is be able to find the opportunity, right? So when you, um, a lot of people, they look at real estate and they just focus on the, the cap 
you know, they say, what's the cap rate? Um, really, it's about finding an asset that you can see value in. The, the current owner is doing something wrong. There's some defect. The rule of the game, never pay market value for a property. Right? Mm. So once you do that, you eliminate all the other properties that are on the MLS or LoopNet or wherever, wherever people are searching for properties. Um, eliminate those because those are properties that the owner, the seller, they're looking for market value. What I do is give people methods to find properties in alternative ways, right? Mm. So, and there's a number of alternative ways. Give me an example. A, a prime example is uh, direct, direct uh, you know, when you're looking at apartment complexes in a city, there's only a handful of them. So you literally can list them all out on paper and, and say, well, you know, everything over 50 units, uh, you can find the owners through skip, skip tracing. Mm. Real, really simple. Um, Another way that's been super profitable for me, like I've definitely made over a million dollars using this way that not a lot of people uh, are privy to or, or, or take advantage of, I should say. There's mm -hmm. people that do it, but there's not a lot of people that, that do it uh, exclusively. Right. Um, it's going to your municipality and getting properties from the municipality, right? Allowing them to basically identify properties that are in their own. If you're, if you're in an inner city there's, that, that has blight, there's tons of there's opportunity, blight. blight, meaning that there's um, some type of depression going on, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of every inner city has that, the hood, you know, right. like I didn't want to say the hood, but, you know, it's, it's like you have a community that is, you know, property values are depressed. Could be because of drugs, crime, what, whatever, gangs, it could be whatever it is, but that's affecting the real estate price. That is a prime opportunity to do forced appreciation because when you're getting the comps, um, most people will try to discount that, right? Mm. Maybe there's a high vacancy rate. Maybe the, the current owner has to do a big repair and they don't have the money to do the repair, right. so they'd rather sell it. That's a, that's a defect. That's an opportunity to buy a property well below the market value and then you can come in and the, mes the method that we teach is through forced appreciation. We remedy the defect. Right. So mm. and when in the remedy of the defect, millions of dollars can be created. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you go on this long journey of investing in real estate. And when do you, do you still have your firm? The CPA firm? Yeah. No, I don't do any. I'm 100 I'm percent focusing on real estate because I'm always going to do real estate. Right. Yeah. Still doing one deal a year. So I'm doing that. But then I'm 100 percent focused on building this black owned FinTech Bank Money App. That is what I do in every day right now. Because real it. estate is boring, by the way. So I have to just say that. Like, because mm. you get to a point where you just have a property manager do everything. It's really not a lot to do, you know? Mm. So you get bored in life. You so wanna, once you figure it out, it's like it, it yeah, rolls it's, and just pays Yeah, it's, it's not really, you know what I'm saying? Like, I love to talk about real estate and, and stuff, but it's, it's like, what? how do I push myself? Mm. Like, when you get to a certain level, um, what do I have to get a thousand unit apartment? Comp? Like, I don't that that money is not going to change anything for me in terms yeah. of trajectory. What will change the trajectory is if I start a business, if I start a bank that's going to create more entrepreneurs, more developers, that's going to allow people to get access to money, that's going to allow them to have products that can leverage the years and years, the decades of wealth building knowledge that I have, if I can pass that on to my children and to other people. I think that's that's legacy. That's how you you build legacy. Gotcha. So mm -hmm. so and, and, and I'm, I'm glad we're segueing into this because I, I I get it now. You've you've amassed a certain level of success and obviously probably through this process you identify a problem, right? And mm -hmm. on top of that, it's like, okay, I'm going to keep making money regardless, but now I need to go I, I, I need to go do something of significance. Absolutely. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So that's why I'm asking everyone to open a money av account. Okay. So let's 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 let's, let's walk let's walk yeah. through what this bank is. Okay. So how did you okay, how'd you start? What was the problem and how are you remedying the problem? Well, the problem really is um there's there's no platform, there's no way in which uh, people can see themselves creating generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And that's really it. The problem is just that generational wealth. Like how do we have wealth in our community and then pass it on? That's yeah. really the problem. 
that is the big problem. Then there's a whole bunch of sub problems that exist around that. So a lot of what is happening is there's a, a, a lot in our a lot of people in our community are unbanked, or they're in a bank, and a lot of the money that they're putting into the bank is going out mm -hmm. into the coffers of the bank, yeah. right? So that is a leakage. You know, the same way that we went out to tackle the tax problem, making sure that we're not throwing money away in taxes, we need to do the same thing on a basic level, a banking level, just on your bank account. So we offer a bank account that allows you to have savings and checking that's mm -hmm. interest paying, and also there's no fees. There's no minimal balance. If you write a check and you know it goes over the amount that you have in the account, you know we don't charge you fees for that. You know, mm -hmm. um, overdraft protection, things like that, right? So that is is the premise. The idea is. You know, we mentioned before, banks every single month make between a billion to 1.5 billion. That is going to disrupt the banks, right? Because that money, that billion dollars that's going into their pockets every single month, we want that to go to the people. We want that to go into the pockets of the people. There's and 30 or 40 dollars for a 25 year old, you know, that's a that could be a big deal. That could yeah. be lunch. That could be, you know, food for the week. Whatever, whatever, you know, they have. It's a big deal. You are you are a very very smart man, and I'm I want to understand the psychology behind it because if if I know that there's no overdraft, I'm almost incentivized to spend more than I have. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be a problem? I don't. I, I honestly I believe in the goodness of people. Right, our bank is here to help the community. Now, if you're the type of person that is a taker and it, you know that that's on you you know mm -hmm. there'll be a catch all for that mm -hmm. but i i honestly believe that if people hear about what we're doing if they know about the outreach if they know about the lives that we're touching the the business owner that's on the corner that has that bodega they can't find money anywhere else and they come to us or that real estate developer that uh, is fixed in all these dilapidated properties in a city, or that person that has a desire, that's what that money is going to go for, mm -hmm. you know? And everything that's deposited in this account is FDIC insured. So the bottom line is, you know, it is a way, it's a pipeline for money to get back into the community. Mm -hmm. And that's really our goal. And, you know, it, it, and we ask, and we start with young people, but we just ask, if you have a few hundred dollars, deposit, put it in there, bill with us. The whole idea is that we need to be a force, right? We can't rely on these national brands to basically just control our, our, the income, the economies of our in our communities. You know, yeah. we want to be a force to, to be dealt with, and we only do that if we get buy-in from our community. Gotcha, you know? gotcha. Mm -hmm. So, you have an idea mm -hmm. to build the bank. Mm -hmm. Where does this come from? Like, do you remember where you was like, yo, you know what? I'm gonna be the bank. Yeah. Um, just doing real estate deals. The bank was always a key player in every deal. Um, like I like I told you before, I was very familiar with the story of Bernard Garrett and Joe Morris. How before they the movie came out? Before the movie came out, you mm -hmm. know, um, Herman J. Russell. Um, in fact, R. Donahue Peoples is a key mentor of mine. I've always been a follower of people that created wealth through real estate. You know, uh, the banks were a key. They're a key clog in that component. The ten most wealthiest companies in the world, right? The top 10, the ones that make all the money, they're either a bank or they're a technology company. We're both. Mm, how so, are you a technology company? We're a technology company because we don't, we're, we're a digital bank, right? We don't have a brick and mortar facility where you can walk in and make a deposit and do a transaction, you know? So that's how we're a technology company. So how do we're I deposit my money? Deposit your, there's every, See, that's the other thing, too. Everything is going digital these days. We do use Cash App, PayPal, all of that. It's oh. all going through. We're going to be able to interchange with that, you know, and that's really the, the science behind it, Solid. you know, making it digital, making us able to do banking in all 50 states as opposed to, you know, just banking with the 20 back black banks that exist right now. They're just kind of regional banks. They just operate in a specific area. We're able to come in and be the bank for the whole country. You know, mm. with aspirations to tailor, kind of focus on a particular clientele and give them the utmost in value and service. You know, mm. so we have lots of features, lots of things that they're not doing. I think that we're this is a unique opportunity. And it's open now. The it's open. open now. It's open now. We're actually 
Um, we don't have our full banking facility open just yet, but we, the bank is open, meaning that we're lending. We have products that are open now. We've been doing it. We actually rank uh, number nine. We're the fastest growing fintech uh, uh, platform in the space. We're ranked mm. 199 on the, uh, the Inc. 5000 as well out of the top 500 companies in the country. We're ranked 199 as, on that wow. as well. Um, so we've come in, created this million dollar business. We have momentum. We have over 45,000 clients already that, that do business with the bank, but we don't have the ability yet because it took us through regulatory situations. We had to go through this compliance situation. It took us time to get our depository accounts bubbling. We had to go through this process with the FDIC to make sure that our accounts are going to be uh, 100% insured. So if you put money into it, you can't say, well, this is something that uh, you know, it's going to fall apart or something yeah. like that. No, your money is 100% insured up to $250,000, you know. So gotcha. that's basically, you know, people need to know this is a safe platform. Yeah. This is the wave of the future. It's similar to Amazon. So when Amazon first came out the box, you know, a lot of people weren't buying stuff online. Yeah. But, you know, years, every single year, people started to buy more and more yeah. online to now where everybody's buying stuff online. For sure. All you see is these Amazon packages getting delivered. Now they're talking about getting drones, delivering packages. This is the wave. This is where banking is going. You know, mm. this is where, where it's happening. We're looking to be at the forefront of that mover movement and be disruptors in the industry. And we want to change the paradigm so that now when you think of a bank, you're thinking of somebody that you can just reach out. Like if you need to, like I'm a co-founder and owner of this bank. Mm -hmm. If anybody needs to reach out to me, I'm going to give them my, my personal cell phone number. You can reach me at 201-822-9230, right? You do that, you can reach out to me. So you have access to the CEO of a bank. You know, mm. this is where banking is going. It's going to be personal. You need a loan. You need, you want to be a real estate developer. You want to be a person that um, starts a business. Let me show you how. Reach out to Money App and, you know, we're going to show people how to do it. Wow. So how did you start it? How do you start a bank? Like, how, mm -hmm. how much money did you need? We started our bank with $10 million. $10 million. $10 million. And that was like to, to have in the bank to secure these other... No, that's our own money. Me and uh, my partner, we invested that money. Who's into your partner? Will Mingo. What's he do? How'd you like Will, him? So Will Mingo's an interesting cat. Like, you don't see him a lot, but uh, um, but he's he's an interesting guy. So Will Mingo... You got a cool name, too, Will <laughs> Mingo. Dang, yo. Yeah, Will, Will Mingo uh, is... is uh, He's he's a he's a legendary cat out here in the streets of the ATL, but because uh, he went to school out here. But um, he Michael Dell, you heard of Michael Dell? Yeah. So Will Mingo worked exclusively with Michael Dell, uh, mm. setting up Dell Computer. So he's wow. he's been uh, privy some, to some of he's worked with some of the greatest business minds uh, in the in the business, and um, Will has put together the technology stack to make money app what it is today. Like he's, he was really the pioneer mm. of uh, the technology stack. And, and uh, when we, when we linked up together, we talked about it and, and uh, you know, we're, we're putting, we put out our, our MVP minimal viable product. Um, we put it out in the market and uh, you know, it's, it's, tr it's getting traction. We started to lend, we started to um, help other people. We started regionally like in Jersey and along the Eastern yeah. seaboard, help other people just get loans for homes. Um, investment, pre pretty much a lot of investment property, yeah. commercial loans. So we went into that space and then we just started, you know, things started to grow. Um, the business credit aspect was something that, you know, we also said, look, there's a real need, particularly in our community, for we need more creators. The problem is nobody has money to start these businesses. Let's come up with a way we can get them the money, yeah. right? And we crafted a way which we can get every person with the LLC at least $50,000. Some people get more, but we crafted a way that it can be done. Then when we did mm. that, we seen people, we seen it work, you know, and uh, people started to, you know, start businesses. Some business, you know, most businesses fail, but at least they're creating, at least they're trying, and they're doing it safely. And safely is the key, because I think that's what differentiates our product and, and what we're offering compared to other others that are doing it. The way that we do it, you're, it's not tied to your personal credit profile. You know, it's the mm. way in which the masters 
of business credit have done it. People like Donald Trump, right? So Donald Trump has filed for bankruptcy four times, but he's never filed for bankruptcy under his personal social security number. So in 1992, when he filed for bankruptcy, that very same week he filed for bankruptcy, he opened up five other LLCs, you know, and leveraged each one of those for hundreds of millions of dollars. You know? Oh, wow. So How does that work, though? So I, I got a bunch of LLCs. I mm-hmm. mean, how do you leverage that? So first off, anybody with an LLC, you can get them at least 50000 Absolutely. Absolutely. And what what is, like, the terms? Because that can't be uh, – uh, I mean, okay, what are the terms? The term, the term, with interest, the terms, the terms yeah. are just that. We, you know, a lot of what that money that, that comes in is uh, – consumer debt, right? Mm-hmm. So the term that fluctuates with the interest rates. So sometimes we get a zero APR, so you don't have to pay interest on it for 18 months. Oh, I need that right now. Right. But when after that 18 months, it may go up to 20%, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's expensive, right. you know, sure. it's not the preferred way, but the idea is to get access to capital Absolutely. to have a concept that you can prove works in the marketplace. That's what we want to do. We want to encourage people to take risk. Right. Yeah. And that's that's really the key. Yeah. And, and I mean, like, let's just say in a scenario, zero interest for 18 months, like mm-hmm. that gives you that gives you enough to get on your feet and really get it going. You know what I mean? It gives that, you the that's opportunity. the opportunity we don't have. Correct. You know, and that and that's really the, that's how you foster ideas. That's how you foster creativity. You know, in addition to that, if somebody has an idea, we also have a fund. We are investing in entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. you know, so if somebody has a, a great idea, reach out to me. Um, because we we make investments, um, you know. We get would you invest of, in my company? I, I would if we liked the idea. I would. All Absolutely. right, we'll go to lunch. I got, I got an idea. Man. Yeah. Investment. So I'm gonna tell you the type of ideas that we like. We like ideas that are scalable, mm-hmm. right? So we have we're investing our own money. So we need ideas that uh, could potentially be a hundred million dollar business. Right? Mm. The reason why that is is because where we're going, we need. We need the company to be scalable. So um, if, prime example, nothing against barbershops, but the barbershop business model wouldn't really be the best business model. We need something that can be scaled, that we can infuse the resources that we have in our network to help people to kind of scale. You know, gotcha. that, that's what it's a formula to this thing that we're bringing. We're not just investing and in, in taking equity. We're bringing, we're infusing you into a whole network of resources. The mm. bank is including in that, but there's also relationships in Silicon Valley. There's lots of, there's lots of other things, tentacles that go along with that. So that's why we're, you know, looking for certain type of companies. Definitely. We, we want you to have a technology angle on it because that's how we create wealth. Like we know what we need to do. Yeah. Wow. All right. So, so for say, I want to go through your bank and I want to get a loan. Mm-hmm. What do I need to have prepared? Depends on the type of loan, right? So, um, typically, we we have a, a product right now. It's we, you can get you a loan in less than three hours, right? That product is very unique on the marketplace um, with our partner. You can go to our website, apply for it. You can get actually anywhere now. It's up to a hundred thousand dollars. In as fast as three hours. And what's the website? Is it moneyav.com? Moneyav.com. Yeah, moneyav.com okay. is the website. Okay. Right? Moneyav.com. Right. Not my money av. My money av is is for our banking product. Gotcha. So my money av.com, if if you guys want to support this bank, be a part of this movement, um, that's where you sign up to to be a part of the bank. My money av.com. Gotcha. Right. But gotcha. our regular website, the one that we've been doing business, the one that, you know, uh, a lot of clients have been, been utilizing is moneyav.com. That's the main gotcha. website. Tom, you got an account? Do you still have your account? Moneyav? I saw, okay. <laughs> all right. Just checking. Okay. Just, Tommy, get an account. I'm getting me an account. I'm just Tommy. <laughs> all right, cool. So, uh, oh, so, so what, what do I need? What do I need to bring to you? Like, do I need right. my. So, my so we t- it's the application online. Get the application. We t- everything is taken care of. Now, we may, depending on how much money you need, you may have to furnish some tax returns, mm-hmm. or you may not, right? Um, but pretty much, so you might it's be able to go with some excellent credit. You got 60, yeah, 60, like you 000. might be, you might be good, and, and we don't even need that. Are they know? short term or long term loans? Those the, the fast money is short term, right? Like how short? Uh, we expect it, you know, depending on the dollar amount as well. But you know, three months, you okay. know, three to six months—that's short term. Mm. Anything more than a year is. 
you know, long term, different. It's rated differently, gotcha. so it's a different type of debt. So we have to put a different price tag to the risk. Gotcha. All right, give me like a long term option where somebody needs they, they need a, a hundred thousand dollars to get this uh, bakery going, right? And they might be already making some money. Um, what, what, what are my options in that regard? So we do we do work with the SBA. Mm-hmm. So we will give you a, a the five A uh, business loan, mm-hmm. um, in which we can get you. You know, that's more of a longer term option. Right. You know, it's a little bit of a paperwork, but you know, we we, we can help you get through that. But um, that that's also that's the option as well for entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's just a regular business loan if it, if it works. If you have assets, whatever you can collateralize, and we we'll. Uh, that's part of what we go through when we help people build, build their business mm-hmm. out. How to get the valuation to get a loan. That's the secret sauce, right? Gotcha. How to get the valuation to build the build. build you got, the loan. Do you have like a three, four step process on getting the valuation? Uh, Would you go share? I, 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 without going into depth, I'll yeah. tell you how it's done, right? Okay. Um, owning your individual entities. So you may own three or four LLCs, mm-hmm. right? So you have... Uh, LLC that, that uh, is public facing, then you have two other LLCs. Basically how it works is those LLCs do business with the LL, the primary LLC, okay. and that creates commerce. When you create commerce, you're actually creating a higher valuation. Give me, hold on. Mm-hmm. I have a studio, Yep. and I have David Chance LLC. Right. That's my main uh, LLC. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do, I'll pay my studio for using the studio from this particular LLC. Correct. Which gives greater valuation to the one I'm paying? Absolutely, because that's revenue, right? And that's what we lend on. We, we lend on a multiple of the revenue. So there's ways in which you can increase the valuation by just having LLCs that you own do business. And I'm, this is not anything illegal. I just want you right. to know... I used to work for a Fortune 500. That's amazing. Five. This, yeah. this is the loophole. Somebody wrote this yeah. into the joint and said, yo, this is what we're going to do. Don't tell nobody. Yeah. All right, but no, but I, I, I used to work for a company. I don't want to put them on blast, but this is a Fortune 500 company that did just that, right? They took, uh, uh, they bought a company that was a loss leader, but they bought it because of that because they wanted to dump losses there. So they basically used that company in preparation for IPO. They used that company to fund, uh, you know, do business with their main company, which increased their revenue, right? Mm. And therefore they got higher valuation, right? Higher valuation, more money from the stock market, more money from uh, other institutions that said, oh, this company has a multiple, you know, a, a revenue multiple of, you know, whatever it is, they were able to get access to more capital. So wow. these are the little things that, you know, the small entrepreneur doesn't take advantage of. What we try to do is number one, just get you in the game, right? Get the business structures, get the LLC, get the business credit, mm-hmm. then focus on how do you turn that into million dollar lines of credit. That's wow. the key. Is there a difference between business and personal credit, though? Absolutely. My friend was telling me that business credit is based on your personal guarantee anyway, or your personal credit. That's not true? That's not true. He made that up? He didn't make it up, because there's there's multiple ways to do it. So he he probably might not have known, right? Right. So um, if what he's saying is true, Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon, when he goes to get a loan, you think he says, oh, I'm Jeff Bezos, I'm going to personally guarantee the debts of Amazon. Mm. Doesn't work like that. Right, 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 right. <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? So the idea is this is the process. Our thing is not an overnight process. It takes six months to build out our business credit program, right? But when it's built out, you have robust business credit that stands on its own, mm-hmm. right? And that's really the key. It's like when you don't, when you're trying to get money really, really quick, what happens is you have to personally guarantee it. But the way that we encourage people to do it, we, do, we tell you to just take the time, build these structures, mm-hmm. because you can eventually keep building them year after year. You can get millions and millions of dollars through your business if you do it correctly. And wow. that's the way. Do it safely and do it correctly. You know, you do it the other way when you use a personal guarantee. You, you're risking losing your house. Yeah. You're, you're risking putting your family in jeopardy. Why would you do that? Yeah. There's a better way to do it. You know, just don't be, it's planning, right? So we got to realize, it's, it's, whatever you do in life, if you take the quick route, it's, I mean, you know what happens. You take the oh, quick route, sorry. right? It's, it may get you so far, but the people that put the time in to do the work, to build it the right way, 
those are the people that are left standing. And that's mm. what we try to encourage. So tell me about the six-month program. Is that something that's public or is that yeah, a yeah. small group? Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a program that we're doing right now, helping people. What we do in that program is literally take any LLC and we build out your business credit. We give you a bunch of different things. We have products that are becoming coming out too. We're going to have a money app business credit card that we're going to be able to give our, our customers, our members, mm. give them that, that, you know, that credit card in itself might be ten fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. You know, that's money that they can use in their business. Yeah. In addition to that, we offer them business loans. And then the ultimate thing, once they have two years tax returns, we can give them up to uh, a half a million dollar uh, business credit product, right? Mm. But that's after you've gone through the program, we know your business, and you have two years of tax returns. So that's something, I think that's going to help out a lot of people too. So, yeah. so how much is it? How much is the course? Is it like a course? Or yeah, so we, our product costs $2,500. Gotcha, so it's 2500 gotcha. and we and, and we work with you on it, right? So um, in terms of, like, our customer service is incredible. I think we have the best in the business in terms of the second you're in our program, we call you, we make sure we check on you, make sure how you're doing. We ask you to hold us accountable. Mm -hmm. That's really the key, right? If we're not performing, you're not meeting your goals, so we ask you to hold us accountable. But we also hold you accountable because yeah. it's a two-way street. So you're responsible to go out, name your business, name your company. You're responsible to set it up. You're responsible to do certain things. You're responsible to set up your own website, do your, you know, mm. do, because we need those things. If you're operating in this time in history and you do not have a website, yeah. people are not going to take you serious, right? Yeah. So we have to make sure that all of our clients are operating from that same basis, mm -hmm. right? And then that is just the foundation. Once we once we build out and we give you that robust credit, we get you in the game, the 50 grand that you have, we want you to use that money to prove your concept, that your business works. If it works, then we show you how to scale. If it does not work, we ask you to start again. Try a new business. Mm -hmm. You can go through it again. The knowledge that we give you, it's based on education, knowledge we give you. You pay one time, you can use it, you can replicate it again. Yeah. You know, so it's an investment in in your future and what you and what you're looking to do. Do you have an affiliate link though? We do. Set me up, my I guy. got you. All right, so let's I got see. you. Click the link below. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Be a part because uh, this this is something that's very very important. And I mean that I mean I'm, I'm asking a lot of like personal stuff, mm -hmm. but I have I've an Amer I've American Express credit cards mm -hmm. on my personal, but I have. A business gold card, but I think it's still using my my personal credit though. You you know how you can tell when yeah. when you got those cards? Did you have to uh, use your give submit your social security number? I think I did. Well, then chances are you've personally guaranteed that because let's say you should stop. Let's say your business goes belly up and you had debt on that card mm -hmm. and uh, you can't pay it. They're gonna come after you. It's gonna be on your personal credit. Trust me. Right. Like we got people, really, that, that, that that's happened to them, right? Yeah. They say, "Oh, well, it's not even reporting on my personal credit." Right. Second, something happens, and ninety percent of businesses fail over the first five years. By the way, mm. right? so you have to think and be prepared, right, for the worst. I'm not saying plan for it, but if you do something and you have an option to do it the safe way or the unsafe way, I'm gonna like when I'm driving, I'm gonna buckle my seatbelt up, yeah. right? Now, I have the option to not wear the seatbelt, yeah. but just in case something happens, I want to be prepared for an accident, you yeah. know? And it's the same philosophy. Going that approach where you're not personally guaranteeing your debt, it's just safer. So how can I do it? I mean, do I just call American Express and say, yeah, I want to apply for one? Well, under once, you, once you've done it, you've done it, because now they're, they're not going to, uh, you know, they, they, have, they have a safety net. If, they, if your company is, is uh, you know, if, they, if, if it doesn't, fulfill its obligations, they're going to come after you. Right. They're going to say, well, what's so Dave? I can't set up Where another, does Dave live? <laughs> I can't get another MX. No, you could. My... You could. It has to be through your business. Right. right. So, so, I, so just... I would apply for, I would apply for it under, but I can't do it under. What if I get a different card? So I have gold. This is the key. This is the key. You have to have robust business credit. It doesn't work. The strategy doesn't work. What does robust business credit mean? The same way, I right, take two people that have a 700 credit score. It's the mm -hmm. best analogy that I can give you. One person has a 700 credit score, but they have one secured credit card that they've had for 25 years, mm -hmm. right? And that's all they have. Another person has that same credit card for 25 years, but they have a car loan, they have revolving debt, mm -hmm. they have a mortgage, they got a house. Gotcha. They have, I mean, there's certain things that you need your business to have the same way you do on your personal side. 
then you also need to, you know, have the business proof. You need to have the valuations. You need to, you know, things like that. You know, you need to, certain things that you need just to get in the game gotcha. in order to operate like that, you know? And, and uh, that, that's what we show. That's what yeah. we show people how to do. Yeah. I feel real comfortable banking with you. Because you you're very, very, like, <laughs> knowledgeable. Yeah. And, I mean, just not only, like, credit or real estate, but mm -hmm. business in general. Like, mm -hmm. how someone can accumulate wealth. That's amazing. I think I think we just need to. And banks don't educate you like that. That's that's the key, right? Yeah. Understand and passing that knowledge on. So what I want to do is reach out to other people that you know have a platform like yourself and work with you. And I know that you have this um, this great initiative going into the schools. How can we support you? How what mm. could we do as a bank to help that initiative? Because you know even you know they're teenagers and you talk to young men, you talk to young women too. But how how can we help you? along your mission to help you achieve your goals with that initiative. Wow. I I do have a way you can help. And I All think right. we can we we can come together because kids need this. This is yeah. the kind of conversation that they need. Right mm -hmm. now they're, mm -hmm. you know, learning a lot that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with them becoming their ideal self mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the the mm -hmm. it, it, it's good information. You need to learn mm -hmm. how to multiply, how to read. You need to know like the history of America. Well, mm -hmm. there's other things in history that they need to be teaching, mm -hmm. especially our kids. Yeah. But yeah. Um, it, it, there's no wealth talk in schools. Mm -hmm. And if a bank really took the time, not just to say um, put our logo on it on you know some sort of initiative just so we can say that we help the community. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. actually, uh, uh, like, w with a heart to go educate our people, that's amazing. And I think that's what you've done today. Yeah, no, that, that, that's what, and you've done it, and that's why I said aligned, like, I feel like we're aligned on that point, too. Like, I, I just want to uh, do what we can. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's to help you bring, you know, to provide a, a, you know, of course, if it's financial, financial, but allow, I think more people need to, to hear that. More young people need to hear that message. And I think that you, the way that you present it, you do it in a very super um, relational and articulate manner that you kind of speak to them on their level. You know, you. and not, not a lot of people can do that. Like, I'm a professor and I, I um, like, this is my first semester of being a professor at Morehouse, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I teach um, entrepreneurship and black wealth, right? That's one of the things I teach at oh, Morehouse, right? I can't wait till y'all get back in school because I want to sit in that class. <laughs> but it's a, it's not easy connecting with young people. It's, mm. you know, the, the music, I mean, everything that they're just being pumped into their, their little heads is opposite mm. to what we're telling them, you know? Mm. Um, and it's difficult to kind of fight through that. So when I see people that are doing things like that, I'm like, you know, how how can I engage with them to 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 uh, help them? You know, how can, how can we multiply that? Yeah. And that's really that's really what we're trying to figure out right now. How yeah. do we multiply it? So. For sure. Well, look, man, I I, I want to say thank you for uh, coming on the show, and um, I I I, I want to know. Um, I like to make predictions on this podcast mm -hmm. where I want to know where you see yourself in the next five to 10 years so that I can look back at this video five years from today and say, yo, Donahue said he was going to do it. And look, he, he did right, it. Right. right. So what do you see for yourself, um, particularly, well, you yourself, but particularly for this bank? You know what I mean? Next yeah. five, 10 years. Yeah. So once I took the challenge to start this bank and go hard, it becomes me. Right? Mm. So when I say that, I can tell you exactly where we're going to be five years from now. Talk to me. Um, you know what a unicorn is? Yes. In the business sense of the word. Yeah, just right. that outlier. No. Well, yeah, you're right, right 100%. Right. But the unicorn in the business sense of the world is a company that's worth $1 billion. Oh, in terms of, no. Yeah. So, yeah. So I didn't know in the that. technology space, when they say, oh, I'm a unicorn. It is a company that's worth $1 billion. Really? Yes. That's, that's what a unicorn is. Oh, I thought unicorn is like, yo, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's unique. a mythical creature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a mythical creature. It doesn't yeah. happen. It's the ally. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So a unicorn but, uh, but yeah, is so, okay, a so company worth a billion. Unicorn status, I, I, I see us hitting there. Um, why? And I'll, I'll give you the trajectory really quick. Um, one of our chief competitors, uh, Chime, which is a, a bank that's pretty much in our space right now. Um, our business model is similar to the to the extent that, that you know we're doing the same thing. They're a unicorn, and actually, they're way beyond a unicorn. They became a unicorn 
in this short period of time. Um, right now, they're valued at $14.8 billion. Mm. And we're in that space. But we're only, we've only capped 1% of the market growth. So not only, the prediction is, not only will we be a billion-dollar company, right? We'll be, uh, we would have created uh, at least, and this is, this is the prediction, because I think it's given that we're going to be a billion-dollar company. But the prediction that I that I that I'm making is, I predict that we would make and have created at least 100. I'm sorry, 1,000 multi-millionaires right? mm. through the services that we provide, through the lending, through the um, you know working with uh, our Donahue Peoples, who has the 500 million dollar fund. That is the level of wealth that we will create, and our hope is those 1,000 multi-millionaires that we create will trickle down to create more minority real estate developers. Wow. So that is the goal, creating entrepreneurs, creating real estate developers. That is our goal, and I'm sure we're going to hit it. Wow. I am sure you're going to hit it. <laughs> like, yo, before you yeah. IPO, can I just get a handshake <laughs> deal that you'll call me when you're saying, yo. No, here's the deal. IPO? Here's the deal. You, your listeners, your you know, people that subscribe to you, we, we can't do this by ourselves. Mm -hmm. you know. So I hope that um, if you're out there, reach out. Uh, definitely on social media, wh whatever it is, because we need we need people. You know, we I want to I want to basically also my personal social media. I'm going to stop filming. I just I'm going to start because I I usually put stuff out to help people mm -hmm. build wealth, but now it's really going to be about everyone else. So I'm going to mm -hmm. start just putting everyone else on my social media. If you have something to say, I don't care what you've done, but if you you know got to be some sense to behind right, right. it. But call me, send me a clip. Uh, and, 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 you know, I'll put it out there. I mean, I just, you know, got a couple, uh, few thousand followers, but mm -hmm. you know, I think that we can make a significant impact. Oh, for sure. Oh, we're going to turn you up on this podcast. <laughs> oh, we're going to turn you up. My man, Melvin Nunnery, uh, shouts out to Melvin. I got to call him today. Actually. Um, he said, man, I, he said, I need to get to a thousand. Now he's, he's, he sold uh, a percentage of his company to uh, the Chinese government for $1.4 billion. Dope, like he's dope. just super successful. Dope. One of the most brilliant men I've ever met. Dope. He's like, man, I gotta get to a thousand followers. And you know, like our interview came out, I think he might be at like 9,000 or something like that. Yeah. He was tracking Lit. it. He said, yo, man, like super 400 is crazy. <laughs> so uh, no, nah, I, I think we'll be able to do some more things together, man. Cause I awesome. really, really love what you're doing and what you represent. Well, yeah. you know, we, we, uh, we, we link, man. We aligned. Yes, sir. So, uh, yes, sir. so I'm gonna reach out. You gotta give me your cell phone. Now. Oh yeah, absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent, absolutely. So look, I, I need you to get some bars together to close us out. Okay, okay. Uh, some, 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 uh, some words for us to live by. Okay, but um, I gotta pay some bills. So this this podcast is sponsored by the Morning Meetup, the Morning Meetup, the only, the only community that gathers entrepreneurs from all across the country every single morning to learn how to start, grow, scale your business. And the network is absolutely amazing. There are people in the group that connect and start businesses together. People that got in relationships together. It's just literally a group of 100, 150 people that gather every single morning on the morning meetup at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So uh, go start your trial for a dollar today. Go to the morning meetup. Okay, Donnie, man. Mm -hmm. Close us out, man. Close us out strong. So what am I saying? Just the words just, of wisdom? Just words of wisdom to close us out. Give us something to take with us today. Um, I just really want to talk for words of wisdom. It's just everybody has the ability to create generational wealth. And my thing has always been how do we create generational wealth? When you think about the great families, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, the uh, Kennedys even, there's something that they did. There was either a, a great matriarch or a great patriarch in their family that made a decision. I want each and every person that's in the sound of my voice to be that person, be that matriarch, be that patriarch in your family that made a decision to create generational wealth. And what that means is you have to make the sacrifice to set up the legacy for the next generation, right? You have to make the choices today to think financially, to improve your financial literacy, because if you improve your financial literacy, you'll make better decisions. You make better decisions, you get more money, you get more money, create more wealth, you have more to invest. The bottom line is it has to be a conscious decision, and that's what I want you to think about. Be that patriarch, be that matriarch, create generational wealth in your family, focus on life insurance, 
Life insurance is key. We didn't talk about it on this interview, but if more of us think about the time that we're no longer going to be on this earth, while we're on this earth, we can make better decisions and wealth is attainable. So there's no need to do anything illegal. There's totally a legal way to do it. There's a right path. I just want to implore you that if you're doing something illegal, if you're hustling something, don't do it. It's not worth the time that you're going to give up. Follow what we're doing. Follow how you can create wealth. It doesn't have to be through real estate. It can be through a business, right? But everyone has a talent. Everyone has something that they do that they're uniquely qualified to do, right? And we all may not be leaders. Maybe we're a follower. Maybe we're a part, a key clog, a key member to a team, right? So I want to leave that with you. Think about life after death. You know, I hate to do the biggie quote, but it's it's true. We need to we need to have that in our mindset and um, and reach out if you if we can help in any way, if the bank can help in any way, reach out, reach out to me, reach out to, to Dave, and and uh, and that's it, brother. That's yeah. that's. And how can know, they find you? I forgot. How, how how can they find you? How yeah, can they connect with you? You can follow me on social media, A Donahue Baker. I also have a YouTube channel, A Donahue Baker. It's A Donahue Baker on all platforms, right? But on my YouTube channel. I am constantly giving wealth building advice. Um, We talk strictly about, and I have a book coming out too. It's called The Skyscraper, The Generational Wealth. It's the six levels to be a real estate millionaire. I bring you through a process. There's a great video on there. If you if you want to know how to be a developer, I'm also dropping gems on that. So on all platforms, A. Donahue Baker, you can find me there. And uh, I look forward to like engaging with people, figuring out what, problems are they're going through and how we can help because i got a big we got a big team it's a lot of us and you're gonna see more and more so we're gonna be able to help a lot of people so i'm not worried about the you know about the volume of people coming in or you can just call me at 201-6 oh hold up 201-822-9230 reach me there and uh that's it Man, I appreciate you, man. Make sure you go follow Donahue, man. I am going to make sure I follow you right now, okay? Because I'm ex- I'm going to go on your YouTube channel because I need more of this conversation. So <laughs> make sure you go follow uh, Mr. Donahue, and um, I will see you all at the bank. Peace.